Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Sarah Fawson, and I'm going to be taking you through my process of building a visual narrative on the legislative roots of mass incarceration in the United States. I created this project as my thesis to wrap up my master's program in data viz that I just finished last December at MICA. Professionally, I've spent time in a variety of fields from supply chain management to design, and I chose to get a master's degree to have a disciplined platform through which I could formalize my knowledge and gain mentorship in a specific subject matter. Something else that has helped me develop my personal style, gain exposure to different forms of data viz, and gain confidence as a designer is starting to share visualizations about topics I'm passionate about on social media. I created an Instagram account called The Data Says, where I've been sharing visualizations that I made. I've been able to refine my personal style, see it change over time, and gain, gain feedback on my work here. As you can see, I like to use lots of color and illustration in my work. Mixing illustration with data visualization is quite powerful because it appeals to both sides of our brain and increases cognition. Data appeals to our logic and by nature, it is true and empirical and illustrations help information feel close, relatable and help you remember them. As I gain more experience in data viz and interest in the criminal justice system, I was approaching the end of my master's program and I had a great opportunity to make something in a longer form narrative where it could communicate more of the depth of a story. Within the criminal justice system in the United States, some of the most concerning high level statistics are, the US locks up people at a higher rate than any country around the world at 698 per 100,000 people. Black men are incarcerated at a disproportionately high rate. Over 5 million people cannot vote in the US today due to a prior felony conviction. In fact, after someone serves their time, their civil rights, human rights, and many economic rights are restricted. These problems often lead to recidivism, a cycle of poverty for few, and a culture of systemic racism for most. What does it mean to be a criminal in this society? The justice system exists to protect Americans and provide fair treatment and rehabilitation to people convicted of a crime. Generally, if you commit a crime, you go to prison as punishment and hopefully rehabilitation. After you serve your time under the law, you're released from prison to resume your life. However, there are major disparities in the express goals of the justice system and what is happening in reality. We are telling people that they need to serve their time for a crime in prison. Then when they get out, they are still lesser than the average citizen and do not deserve all of the rights of that average citizen. People labeled criminals are discriminated against legally after leaving prison. Although we tell people to serve their time for committing a crime, we're not ever letting them out of that legal chokehold. Time is never truly served, but prolonged for the rest of someone's life through restrictions on political rights, employment, and opportunity. This leads to higher rates of racial discrimination and recidivism or returning to prison. Laws vary widely by state and prior crime, but generally these are some of the areas where it exists. Neglect of basic human rights is the most devastating injustice that exists, and it exists at the hands of our government. Injustice will exist when any group of people has absolute power, but we live in the age of information, which can now be used to keep leadership at high and low levels in the justice system accountable. I wanna use my knowledge and skills to communicate this visually so that people can understand the problem better and feel motivated enough to use their own privileges or passion to do something about it. I wanted to understand when time truly is served in our justice system. I started off thinking that I wanted to communicate this in a data journalism piece on the web. And I planned for my process like this. I got to work, I started gathering data and expanding on the research I had done in the past. I created a prototype that framed some of the themes I wanted to cover when it came to felony disenfranchisement and criminal justice reform. I put these together in Figma, then created the more high fidelity design elements in Adobe Illustrator and soon began developing the story on my website. As I started filling in my data and writing the beginnings of my story, I noticed a potential problem. I'm telling a story about the end of something bigger. While still of utmost importance, I have to consider if I will be doing this story justice without enough focus being devoted to the root of the problem. 
why are there over 5 million Americans disenfranchised from the right to vote due, a for, due to a former felony conviction? How did we get here? Why are there so many people in prison that felony disenfranchisement is so depressingly apparent? Hopefully we all know by now that the roots of legalized discrimination run deep in America. My visual narrative should too. It's at this point that I decided to change the medium through which I was telling the story to better suit my strengths and produce something that could really tell the depths of the story. I scrapped the web progress and shifted to a print format where I could use the skills that I'm actually most passionate about, which are infographic design and illustration. This is the most painful realization in any project to scrap your work, but not all of my progress was a sunk cost. I still have a lot of data and understanding of the topic. To start, it's important to level set on the racism that exists in the criminal justice system. These are both very concerning statistics, but the disparity between the two is even more striking when the data shows that crime rates do not vary significantly by race. Here's where I started to bring in some illustration to marry with the data using my Apple Pencil and the app Procreate. It's a lot more striking to see a comparison than to try to interpret two ratios. So I can effectively communicate one statistic with illustration, but I've just opened the door at this point. Now I need to connect this chilling statistic with the system that made it all happen. Since I expanded the aperture of my topic, I dove hard into my research again. These are some of the main sources of information that helped me understand mass incarceration and the role of our laws and culture on our current state. Some of these are books, podcasts, articles, or sources of data either used directly in my work or serving as important context to build my understanding of this very horrible, very human problem. I documented in, on sticky notes and a whiteboard the main themes in American racial history and incarceration statistics today that connect, connect back to the pieces of legislation any year from when the United States was formed until now. It was quite clear through all this research that there were very distinct periods of American history as they relate to race. There were periods of racial control and periods of racial progress or human rights progress. The periods of racial control were slavery, the Jim Crow era, and where we still are today, the era of mass incarceration. The data says that the major periods of racial progress were reconstruction and the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. As you can see, after a period of racial control comes a period of racial progress, followed by a period of control and so on. What this looks like in American history though, is that the periods of racial control are far longer than the progressive periods. This data is already quite telling. The journey to getting this information into an impactful visualization was a long and arduous one. If there's one thing I hope to leave you with, it's that the creative process is messy and that's okay, growth is messy. I put down all the basic timeline points and a summary for each one on a spread in Illustrator using Illustrator because I knew I wanted to eventually get quite creative with the format, believe it or not, based on what you see here. I had absolutely too much information, but I refused to let it go. It's quite a task to be your own editor, but with some encouragement, I finally pared down the content that I had bit by bit. I held firmly to the goal of not just communicating information to be understood, but communicating so that I could not be misunderstood. I obviously needed to find a strong timeline vehicle that, that clearly articulated my storyline which was racial legislative history, or more bluntly, United States legislative history. Inspiration was crucial in my storytelling journey. I wanted to create something as elegant as these that was a delight rather than a burden to read through, but I had some major, major data challenges. For one, my data points, whether they come from data sets or court rulings or legislation itself, were heavily skewed towards recent years. Of course, over hundreds of years, the best data would come from the later years. Additionally, I did not have one or even a handful of data sources. I had a lot of data. My data is very human and particularly context heavy. It's found in stories, in quotes, in comparing patterns in history through the laws, interpretations of laws and defiance of those laws as well. Only a little bit of it comes from cohesive data sets. 
So to my sketchbook, I took it. I spent more time than I care to admit thinking about timeline designs and drawing different types of lines to see if small paragraphs of text would fit inside them. Often the more fanciful you get with a visualization, the harder it can be to read and interpret. And I did not wanna lose my audience to my ego that wanted to build something spectacular and new. None of the forms I was trying were really tr seeming to work. So I revisited my themes. These periods happen one after another, and you could almost say that they're cyclical with a period of progress coming after a period of control. So I shifted my timeline design concepts to be focused on shapes that would communicate the cyclical nature of this pattern. And I finally landed on something that I thought I could work with in the actual design. I developed this concept in Illustrator and started plotting all of my historical points and where I might add more data. Because of my skewed timeline, if I were to put all of the data points and periods of history on the actual visualization, visualization itself, the graphic would be just overwhelming. I'm putting small pieces of information on my timeline visualization by the year they occurred, then using color to drive the reader's eyes from the central viz to the additional parts of the narrative which explain these periods in more detail. I wanted to add some of the key figures that enabled this timeline to exist on the graphic itself. Again, bringing illustrations to my data viz to bring the content to the next level and allow it to be more relatable. I illustrated these political figures who were crucial in changing or perpetuating systemic racism through legislation or the communication and normalization of that legislation. In a sense, these are some of my data set creators because their actions heavily shaped the history of the United States racial policy and culture. I expanded on my visualization, transforming it into an infographic with several different pieces of data that support the story I am driving through the spread. And with the supporting historical context that I didn't want to lose, listed essentially as reference material on the right side, along with my key players and how they shaped the history. It became quite obvious that I was doing more harm than good with this layout. Although I wanted to light up the visualization of text, I'm relying on the reader constantly looking back and forth from the timeline to the reference material, which could cause a lot of fatigue and quickly lose their attention. Again, I needed to make sure that I'm communicating so I cannot be misunderstood, which means that I need to make some more editorial decisions so that all my data, which I consider quite fragmented, doesn't come across as disjointed to the reader as well. There's some helpful editorial comments from my thesis cohort and many kind and generous others that I ran my project by. I was able to balance the information a lot more effectively by reformatting the design and how it fits in with all the necessary text. Both are essential data pieces. They're just in different formats. My main timeline events and key data points are central all the supporting evidence and the role of political figures would support the main event from the side. You can read through this text that I shaped on the page to understand the nuances of historical events and laws that criminalize blackness. But how do we see in the data how these things have led us to a system of mass incarceration? Well, we have good data on that piece. Starting in 1925, imprisonment data was collected in the US. And you can see that it took an absolutely drastic spike that in no way was attributed to natural population rises or even rises in crime. So what could it be attributed to? These are policies that were enacted by some of the key players in the timeline graphic that I showed before. These policies directly attributed to spikes in law enforcement funding and incarceration rates, and also drastic drops in federal rehabilitative programs. I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't have a justice system or prisons in America, but is this necessary? Why are we locking up so many people and especially so many nonviolent offenders, if not for control and sowing fear into the public for political gain? We still have over 2 million people behind bars in the US today. But again, the raw number itself is hard to interpret without context. If we take a look at countries similar to the US, their rates of incarceration per 100,000 people are dramatically lower than the US. So this provides the context to show why the problem of disenfranchisement is so large. More people going to prison generally means more people leaving prison. 
Now that we've explored the history and underlying reasons, now we can approach the problem that I initially set out to inform people about. We know there is institutional racism and systems of control built into America, and mass incarceration is a system of control. And we can see very clearly that the rights that are restricted after someone leaves prison are just a continuation of control to lessen others' voices, particularly voices that come from people of color. As Desmond Mead, an activist and former prisoner best said, once a person has served their time, they should not be made to continue paying for their past mistakes. So here's the finished product. It's intended to be read and perused in detail based on the print format that I designed it in and the text that I felt that I needed to include to provide enough context on the topic. So I'll share a link for you all to read through the final product and understand this topic in further levels of detail on your own. Going through the pages, I'm starting off again by level setting the audience on the racial disparity in sentencing, which is the indicator that helps us understand what we're about to be reading more about. In the, tenet, in the text, I'm connecting this data to how racism has manifested in the United States history, introducing the main time periods that I'll be exploring further with data. The timeline serves to then enforce with visual messaging and supporting detail, the impact of America's periods of racial control, particularly supported by quotes, context, and hard facts. I'm then bringing the reader into specifically the period of mass incarceration, what the data says today, and I'm also reinforcing my prior point about how our tough on crime legislation has caused a massive spike in sentencing. Life after prison is a continuation of the systems of control that led most people to be incarcerated in the first place. You can see the disparities in voting rights across states while also reading an account of one man's experience being rebounded back into prison because he couldn't afford to pay for a phone so that he could check in with his probation officer. At the end of it all, I want everyone to be an activist. I've provided some resources to get readers started to help reform the justice system based on different areas they might be interested in. And this is also certainly not the last of what I'll be creating on the topic either. As W.E.B. Du Bois said, the burden belongs to the nation and the hands of none of us are clean if we bend not our energies to righting these great wrongs. Thank you all so much for joining. I hope this inspires you all to take on projects of your own and tell data stories, and most importantly, to make your own voices heard. Thanks.